go ahead and get started. Um, can you hear me or do I need to talk on this mic? No. Good. So my name is Shweta Kakredi. Um, I'm on the AFSA Board of Directors, but I was also on the Executive Council and in time. Um, I'm also, a, my full-time job is that I'm a resident. So I'm a, I'm a second year resident in radiology, and so I finished my MD PhD from the University of Illinois in biophysics, doing breast cancer imaging, and now I'm in radiology, so it kind of makes some sense that I'm, I'm in that field. <laughs> but I've been given the honor and the opportunity to be moderator for this panel. Our panel is titled Public Outreach of the Physician Scientists. So I just wanted to kind of start by saying, um, so my grandfather actually is 101 years old. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Believe it or not, some cookies for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of them is peanut. That one's peanut, so don't be okay. allergic. So my grandfather is, was also a professor, and he was also a doctor. So he told me that it's not enough to treat the patients. You also have to educate them, and you also have to look at their well-being. His patients were animals. They were elephants and tigers. <laughs> so you can imagine that communicating was slightly a bit of a challenge. And then, of course, you have to explain to the farmer or to the elephant manager how to do this. And it's a whole setting, right? Then it comes to me, and he's like, well, your patients are humans, therefore it's easier. You can talk to them, and they'll understand what you said. And so that's where we're at. We are all trainees in, physici in becoming physicians and becoming scientists. But it's not enough that we spend our time to learn how to do an HMP, see the patient, collect the labs, collect the imaging, come up with an assessment plan. No, because then you're in the lab, and then you do some data analysis, you look at the data, you try to figure out what's going on and make a discovery. But that's not enough, right? Because you can't just write a paper and that, think that's enough. You have to communicate to the patient. But now, what we're talking about is taking it to the next step. We're talking about not just about communicating, educating the patient, you have to think about the patient in the whole community setting. So that's their housing situation, their family situation, the town situation. So today, uh, we'll be talking about how the age of social media and information technology can aid the physician scientists in the effective practice and communication of medicine. We have on our panelists three wonderful prominent figures here. So I'll begin with Dr. Naranjan Kardik. So he's an associate professor of psychiatry at, in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Department of Psychiatry at Rush Medical College. At, College, and he's also an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Community Systems and Mental Health Nursing at Rush University. His focus is on community-based interventions for high-risk with youth, uh, high-risk youth with psychiatric and substance use disorders. In the past, he has worked with refugee children in Pakistan, Afghan border, the streets of India, the foster kids in central Illinois, and the incarcerated in California. More recently, he's worked with with the Youth Homeless Shelter in San Francisco and continuing his work in Chicago. The major research focus is using mobile health technologies to bridge the needs for the vulnerable youth and enable the providers to deliver these services at high-risk populations. Next, we have Dr. Clara Pomeroy. She is the president of the Albert and Mary Lascar Foundation. She serves as the chief executive officer of the foundation and is responsible for overseeing the implementation of programs that advance the foundation's mission. The foundation's mission is the following, to foster the prevention and treatment of the disease and disability by honoring excellence in basic and clinical science through public education and research advocacy. She has a tremendous CV, which I will try to shorten up, which is she's a longtime advocate of patients, especially those with HIV and AIDS and public health. She passionately supports the research in all areas. She continues research looking at viral infections. She has a special interest in healthcare policy with a focus on the importance of social determinants of health. And of course, she's published over hundreds of papers of books and chapters. She's a member of the Board of Trustees for the Morehouse School of Medicine and serves as director of, Board of Directors for the Sierra Health Foundation as well as biomedical research. She's part of the Blue Ridge Academic Health, serves on the VA National Academic Affiliations Council. Past roles include 
being part of the Board of Directors for the Associate of Academic Health Care Centers, being part of the AAMC, and also being a member at large for the AAS. But I thought it was very interesting to note that she's been the Chancellor of the Healthcare System and Dean of the School of Medicine at UC Davis. And then we also, our third speaker is Dr. Bashara Shoker. He is Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. I had to practice saying his name. <laughs> this is why this is a little entertaining for them. <laughs> so he was appointed on November, 20, November 25th, 2009 in reshaping the department to meet the public health challenges of the 21st century. Most recently, uh, with the full report support of Dr. Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Dr. Shoker unveiled the Healthy Chicago. This is an, a, a program, the first citywide public health agenda. It is a call to action for all Chicagoans to work together on a common vision of making Chicago the healthiest city in the nation. I'm from Illinois, so I'm really happy. <laughs> so under Sh Dr. Shoker's leadership, the Chicago Department of Public Health became the first big city um, public health agency to receive the national accreditation. He holds adjunct associate professorship at the Department of Family and Community Health at Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University. So, I'll just begin with one question for each of our panelists, and after that, I will open it up to the whole, all of you, and, and to hear your questions and your thoughts. So, we'll start with Dr. Karnick. Dr. Karnick, how, how do you stress the importance of medicine, and in what ways do you think the next generation of physician scientists can contribute to this field? Working with the young and the youth, how do you, how do you reach to them and connect to them? Okay, well, I mean, um, so my, my PhD actually, um, unlike probably most of you in the audience, actually in sociology. Um, I actually came out of the medical scholarship program that you were in, in Illinois. Um, and so the, the social aspects of medicine were really relevant to me from an early time point. And I think, you know, in getting trained as a child psychiatrist, you quickly learn how to talk to young people. But one of the things that I've realized, you know, in, in recent years is that technology is this ever rolling wave for children and for young people. And I consider it part of my job to try and keep abreast of what is going on. Um, the, the commissioner and I actually connected over Twitter some time ago. And, and you know, that being on Twitter, is, it, it's not something that I do a lot of, but it's something that I feel like I need to keep engaged with in order to connect with young people because those are the people I talk to. And I can assure, I tell parents all the time that if I'm on Twitter, assuredly their children are not anymore because it's probably not that cool anymore and there's probably some other electronic social network that they're probably on and and I often sort of try to keep abreast of the sort of current waves of technology change and think about how we can leverage those those forms to you know reach out to these kids and and perhaps you know change their the direction that they're in or improve their lives Dr. Pomeroy, given the, the goals of the Last Breath Foundation for prevention and treatment of disease and disability and then research in clinical science, how do you see this mission going out and how do you see the Lascar Foundation? And can you speak more about these? So I was really delighted to come talk to all of you because you're entering medicine at this incredible moment um, when medicine is being redefined in the United States, it's being redefined globally as, you know, as a global entity. And you are also bringing a unique perspective as um, MD, PhD students. You understand that there is a need to combine the clinical excellence with, with research and science and, and, and discovery. For, I think for each of us, the way we do those things is defined by our core values, and that comes from our life experiences. And for me, I think there were two really formative life experiences. The first was growing up in foster care. And 
you know, as a kid who spent some time on the street and a kid who went through a bunch of foster homes, that tells you that your well-being, your health, is dependent upon a whole lot of things beyond doctors. And then I became an HIV doctor. And I was an HIV doctor at the beginning of the HIV epidemic. And I saw what discrimination and stigma and misunderstanding did to the ability to care for people with HIV. And I also saw the need for research. And so I understood that these life experiences sort of shaped my core values. And each one of you has life experiences that have shaped your core values. And I understood that if I was going to take care of patients the way I wanted to take care of patients, it needed to be this combination of taking care of the whole patient, the holistic care that we talk about, addressing things like poverty, addressing things like housing and job opportunities and education, and, and making sure people felt like that they had a role in society, uh, that they weren't marginalized, they weren't discriminated against. All those things I knew were the responsibility of the physician. And I also knew that if we didn't discover new medications, if we didn't discover new public health policies around HIV, that this epidemic was literally threatening the globe. And it had to be bringing those things together. But the bottom line is, if we're going to do the right research, and that's what Lasker is dedicated to, is using research to find answers to improve health. If we're going to do the right research, we have to ask the right questions. And that means asking, in my opinion, asking questions across the range of all of those things. And doing research that ranges all the way from fundamental science through translational work, through clinical studies, through implementation science, through public health research. We, have to, we will not get the answers to better health unless we have discoveries and breakthroughs across that entire spectrum of research. And that means that we have to have people with diverse backgrounds. And when I say diverse backgrounds, I mean personally and scientifically. And we have to build teams in, that, in, by the way, include the patient and include the community that define the questions that we want to ask. And when we do that, we as physicians need to take the responsibility to speak up. So we know a lot of things from research about what it takes. I mean, we know that the health, the health of, uh, of uh, a community the, is defined only in really small part by what we do in the clinical care system, right? About 10%. That means 90% of our research should be on things outside of that setting if we're really going to get there. We as physicians have to talk about what are the right questions, what kinds of research do we want to do? How do we get society to take responsibility for the vulnerable? And I think that's what's exciting about the fact that there are these new methodologies, social media, um, and there is a new generation, you guys, out there who thinks about medicine in a new way. Dr. Shoker, can you talk about your perspective on these issues of public health? and the social media tools. Sure. So uh, first, I want to welcome everybody to Chicago. I, I know some of you are from Chicago, but others are visiting. And uh, by the way, the weather is always just like today. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's great weather. But, but um, you know, I, I want to point out that I'm, I'm a family physician, and I um, trained in a healthcare for the homeless program. So I spent most of my clinical career dealing with people experiencing homelessness. And, and throughout the years, what I've realized is the thousands and thousands of patients who I've seen that we're all dealing with very similar issues. And, and at one point, I've just realized that really we as a society put these policies, put the systems in place, created the environment that's really allowed homelessness to happen from the get-go. So at one point in my career, I asked myself, you know, 
is what I'm doing good enough or should I start focusing more upstream? I felt like I was running and running and running and trying to catch up, but I've really realized that I needed to focus more upstream. And, and I started digging a little bit more into health economics. I started digging more into social determinants of health. And the, the data geek in me got really excited and, and actually, unfortunately, really, really sad. So when you, when you think about it, and so I'm going to take you into some numbers that, that um, some of you, if you're interested in health economics, you probably know those numbers. But in 2012, as a country, we spent $2.8 trillion in health care. In one year, 2012, $2.8 trillion went into health care. That's, that's the fifth largest economy in the world. We're big, our healthcare cost is bigger than the GDP of France as a country. That's just that alone. So I started realizing that something is not right. So we are spending a lot of money. Then why am I seeing so many people experiencing homelessness? We spend 40% more on healthcare per person than the next highest country in the world, and that's Norway. 40% more. And if you look at most of the research that's out today, it tells you that I think we're spending a little bit over $700 billion every year into healthcare than what we should be spending for outcomes that are honestly not very flattering. So we needed to do something that's, that's very different. And even when you look at the rate of growth as to how we're spending money into healthcare, you'll see that our rate of growth in healthcare spending is growing faster than our regular GDP. There's this number that we, we use, it's GDP plus 2%. So we, our rate of growth is 2% higher than the GDP year after year after year. So if you plug in the numbers here, in, in 1970, we used to spend, out of every dollar we spend in this country, six cents used to go to healthcare. Today it's 18 cents. And this is just non-sustainable. If we were getting the right outcomes, I would be fine with it. But we, we are not. Our health outcomes are not so promising. So when I, when I made the shift completely into public health, I really realized that we really needed to focus more on policies. We needed to focus more on systems. We needed to focus more on environments. So we can create these environments where people could live in and grow in a healthier manner so that we don't have to be spending all these dollars in tertiary care and hospitals. Um, you know, Claire mentioned that when you look at what really defines healthcare, really it's only 10% of that, that definition of healthcare comes from the clinical systems. The rest comes from our environment. So how do we invest into the right types of research? How do we invest in trying to leverage what we learned from research into changing policy is something that I'm extremely interested in. And that's exactly what we're doing in Chicago. So we try to see what are we learning from the research? What are we learning from um, community participatory research or what we're learning from bench research, but really take it into the policy level. That's why you'll see us you know, in Chicago leading the country on policies like restricting the sales of flavored tobacco around schools or restricting the sales of e-cigarettes, flavored e-cigarettes around schools or requiring retailers that are selling e-cigarettes to putting these e-cigarettes behind the counter so they're no longer within arm's reach of kids. That's why we're investing in policies like mandating um, the right types of, of nutrition, physical activity standards, or screen time in our daycare centers so our kids, when they come to schools, they're at a healthier weight. So all those types of investments are really key if we're serious about moving the needle on population health. So if I could just add, you know, we just heard Dr. Agre talk about um, he won the Nobel Prize and he went back to, to, to study malaria, right? And out of passion, which is great. And, but when you think about how we treat malaria now, we have great malaria drugs. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry did just fine on that, right? But the fact is they don't get taken by many people. Many people don't have access to them. And we haven't done research on how you de develop the healthcare delivery systems to get those drugs to those people. And furthermore, we haven't done basic research that allows us to develop a malaria vaccine that would you know, obviate the need for all of those delivery systems and all of those drugs uh, down the line as well. And so 
what I would like to advocate for is how do we make sure that there's a, a full understanding of, at, at all of the points along the way of what we need to do research on, how we need to change our clinical care, and it comes from the real upstream things like prevention um, all the way down to the frontline things. How do you get a poor kid who lives in the middle of Africa to the clinic? And each of those things, from understanding the aquaporins in, 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 in the malaria mosquito, all the way to that, that healthcare delivery system in, in rural Africa, all of those things are, have the potential to do research. Because they're unanswered know, questions. Yeah, and, and you know, just right after we started the panel, we were chatting, um, and Claire and I were talking, and, and uh, Niranjan were talking about, you know, our HIV um, data here in Chicago. So you, we just issued a report as a department that tells a really good story. You know, year after year after year, we've seen declines in the number of new cases of HIV, number of new diagnoses of AIDS. We've seen the number of people living with HIV growing, the percentage of people with viral suppression going higher. We're almost at 87% of people linked to care have HIV viral suppression. Great stories. But when you dig deeper into the data, what we realize is while we've seen the improvements at almost every one of our you know, population or subpopulation, there's one group that we're not making nearly as good of a progress. We're actually getting worse, and that's the young black men who have sex with men. And the sim there are so many reasons as to why this, and, and I don't think any of us would venture to say that we understand why. But one key reason is most of our research has never been done really on young black men who have sex with men. Most of our research is done with middle-aged white men in big cities and, and different environments. So we really need to be very aggressive in asking the right questions and researchers helping us try to understand the answers to those really tough questions. Open it up to anyone to ask questions. And while you're formulating, oh, go ahead. Well, first of all, thanks for coming. But um, so I'm wondering if there is a role for the physician scientist in training in community outreach. Because um, obviously, as physicians, we would all love to do the things that y'all are doing. But as far as right now, um, in our training careers, if there's a role for us and what that might look like. So I'll start, and then we can each answer your question, which is fantastic. OK. So um, there absolutely is a role. And it's more than a role. I think it's a responsibility. Um, I think that as, as the next generation of physicians and as physician scientists, um, we, you need to look at where society is putting its money and putting its emphasis and putting its priorities. And right now we're defunding research at the level of the NIH. We are not supporting young people well who want to have careers in medical research. And we can sit around and we can lament that in groups like this. Or we can get together and we can go out and we can talk to Congress people and we can write letters to Congress people. We can talk to our coworkers, and, you know, people who live next door, churches, synagogues, whatever. I think that everyone in this room has a responsibility to raise their voice about what's happening in healthcare and what's happening in medical research, especially around funding in, in this country and globally. And I will tell you that when we go to talk to thought leaders, whether they're Congress people or major donors or whatever, frankly, they're tired of listening to us because we've been like talking about this for a long time. But if a young person comes with the passion that you have for your research or for your patients, your stories are very powerful. And your voices are very powerful. So write letters, write op-eds, Talk to Congress people. I don't mean at the expense of your studies, but, but, but do it. Because if you or physicians or researchers stay in their clinics and their labs and they don't get out and talk to the public, then this defunding of medical research is all of our responsibilities. We have to raise our voices. Did you want to add something? Well, I, I, I think I agree with everything you said. I, I, the only thing I would add to it is that I think that all of you have a sort of narrative about what you're doing and why you're doing it. I mean, you know, 
people don't accidentally go into a physician scientist training program. <laughs> There's just no possibility for that to happen. People can accidentally go into PhD programs, and people <laughs> can sometimes mistakenly make the choice to go to medical school. But people who cho choose this dual path, you know, there's usually something motivating you, some interest. And I think, as Claire was saying, I think it's really incumbent on you to talk about that. And I would take, you know, whatever opportunities you have to talk even to just you know people in your families, people in your social circles. Um, I used to sit on planes and, and actually wait until the person spoke to me, and they usually asked me what I did. And then you know, as a psychiatrist, I'm always hesitant because you know, depending on how long the <laughs> plane ride is, <laughs> and if you're a child psychiatrist, then you got to hear about their grandkid who has ADHD, and you know, doc, what do you think about this? And so. Yeah, so then I started telling people, oh, I'm a sociologist, and then that would just shut down the conversation. <laughs> you know, they didn't know what to say to a sociologist. Now I actually am a little bit more proactive sometimes, and I'll talk to people, and then they'll ask me what I do, and I start talking about the, the, the young people I work with, the vulnerable kids that I work with. And what's been really interesting is talking to them about the fact that there is such limited funding that it is really hard to work in this area. It's hard to convince institutions to invest in this area of work, right? Because all of them will say to me, that's really great you're doing that. And I said, well, you know, I do this because I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this. I want to help these kids. But there's a limit to how far I can do this. You know, for the past four years, I've actually self-funded a lot of my research using forensic income that I get for doing legal expert witness work. And I just channel that into this, you know, funding stream for my, you know, so that my students and I can do the work that we want to do. And that lets me keep a project going of a certain size. But now, if I want to scale it up, I need more funding. So I started explaining this to some people. And wouldn't you know, like, there's a guy on the plane, you know, and he, he towards the end of the flight, he starts, he starts, like, revealing his cards. And he gives me his card. And the guy is, like, a vice president at Fleischmann Hillard, which is, like, a major advertising corporation here in Chicago. And, you know, I, I Googled him when I got to the hotel <laughs> room. And I was like, who is this guy? And I Googled him, like, Wow, I was like, oh my God, he's like the vice president for the Americas. I was like, so this guy is in charge of like half the world's advertising or something <laughs> like that and goes to some Davos meeting, you know, and, and he was like, you know, I want you to keep in touch with me because he's like, I think I can get, you know, AT&T or Samsung to, you know, help you do some of the work you want to do with smartphones, you know. And he and I kind of correspond over email and he's kind of working on this. And so I think, you know, that's a way that you all could do the same thing. I mean, there was nothing intrinsic to me or to what I'm doing that you all couldn't do for your own projects, and you're doing a great service for science in that regard. Um, so now my university actually probably going to pull this guy onto their board of trustees at some point because, you know, that's the way they groom donors, you know, and I, I threw the whole ball into the development office's lap. And, but you guys can do that. I mean, if you talk just about what you do, I think you're going to get people interested. And I think, I mean, the other opportunity to keep in mind is, is try to figure out what are the venues in your um, city, in your you know, county, whatever you work with, to see if there are venues where you, your voice could make a difference. So here in Chicago, for example, the health department, we have a committee that's, that's Students for Healthy Chicago, where students, and not just medical students, law students, journalism students, uh, really come together and advocate on very specific topics. So you know, when, when we were advancing, our uh, restriction of the sales of flavored tobacco around schools. This was not an easy law to pass through our city council. Big tobacco lobbyists were all over City Hall. They were knocking at every alderman's door. We were getting Twitter bombs left and right. The department, we couldn't even respond to any of the tweets. So I mean, there was a lot of big pressure on us. That Students for Healthy Chicago Committee, those voices were very, very helpful. They held press conferences. They came with us. They testified at city council. And the, the, the ordinance passed 44 to 5, which was a really great. I mean, at one point, we weren't sure we have the 27 votes that we needed to pass that. 
but then there are also opportunities for students to be involved in, in government agencies and other not-for-profit. So in Chicago, we have a program called um, Play Streets, where we take neighborhoods with the highest rates of violence and with the lowest rates of um, lowest availability of parks, and we take streets in those neighborhoods, block those streets three hours a week, every week, and turn them into big play lots. And that whole project that's now serving 25,000 kids in Chicago, it's in its third year. It really started with an MD, PhD student who took a year off between the third and fourth year of medical school and came and she came and spent her time at the health department. She literally single-handedly researched what that model might look like. She wrote the grants that got us the seed funding to make it happen. Then she wrote the RFP for community-based organization to apply to make it happen. And she wrote the first original first year evaluation proposal. She's now a family medicine resident in, in Lawrence, Massachusetts. But that program that's now in its third year really started because a student really took the time and energy to make it happen. So there are a lot of opportunities where students could make a difference and, and um, you should take those very seriously. And, and I would also add that make sure that you use your voice effectively and efficiently. So everyone in this room should have their two minute elevator speech about the the work that they do that they're passionate about. So uh, how many of you have practiced your two minute elevator speech? All of you? Okay. Take the chance to, and you know, it might evolve over time, and that's fine, okay? But practice with your friends. Don't be giving your elevator speech the first time you walk into the city council or your congressman's um, office. Practice with your friends and make sure you have your elevator speech down. Okay. The other, the other thing is, and this brings it full circle to the topic that we're talking about, is social media is a very effective way to get your voice heard. And you can reach a lot of people with um, a Twitter, a, you know, a, a Facebook page, or whatever. So use, use those social media tools effectively as well to complement the one-on-one -on -one, um, articulate expression of what you're passionate about. Well, so I'll start, and then the then you guys can um, add more. Um, the first thing is exactly what you said, which is define your audience, okay? Because your elevator speech sh to a general lay audience should not be the same as the elevator speech to your major professor, okay? You probably need both. Um, and I think that the art of communication is the ability to take something that's, you know, your, your research is on very complex stuff. But if you truly understand it, you can explain it to anybody. It's the people who don't really understand it who have to use big words. So use small words, start at the beginning, build up the understanding, and don't try and explain everything in the elevator speech. What is the problem you're trying to solve? How are you solving it? And how will that make the future different? That's, that's, you know, they each get 20 seconds at the most. I mean, think about that. That's pretty hard to do, right? To distill down this stuff that you're working hours and hours and hours and days and weeks on. But that's, that's what you really need to do. And don't use big words and don't use jargon because you really do understand what it is. And tell people what the importance is. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. It's actually something that just happened just a few months ago here in Chicago when we started uh, when we started regulating e-cigarettes. And you know, when you go and ask people about e-cigarettes, a lot of people think, oh, e-cigarettes, they're actually good. They'll help you quit smoking, da 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 da. So I spent a lot of time with people doing research on e-cigarettes. You know, what's in that quote unquote water vapors? What are the carcinogens that are there? What are the chemicals that are coming out? What are the potential implications of these? 
chemicals, what's the concentration of these chemicals and the, you know, and the vapor and all of that. And I spent a lot of time trying to understand all the science behind it. But when I was trying to sell it to Rahm Emanuel, I did not bring most of the stuff in. What I told the mayor, and then eventually I told all city council to get them to vote on the ordinance, is look, these e-cigarettes, they're designed to look like cigarettes. They contain nicotine-like cigarettes. They're marketed and sold like cigarettes. We should simply regulate them like cigarettes. What that means, we need to make sure that kids can't purchase them in the city of Chicago. We want to put them behind the counter so they're no longer within arm's reach of kids. And we want to make sure that we're not allowing people to smoke them where you cannot smoke regular cigarettes because we want to protect the rights of our residents to breathe clean indoor air. All the science and all the time that I spent with the scientists who are working on this issue distil get literally distilled to this two-minute speech. And that's what resonated with every one of the, well, 44 of our 50 aldermen with the <laughs> mayor and the people around them. So that's how you're going to have to be able to distill all the message. In some instances, so when I was testifying in city council as to why I believe this is important, some aldermen really asked and dug deeper into what are the chemicals and why. And then I had all the answers. But in my two minutes speech or my sound bites that ended up on you know television and all of that, it was this. It looks like a cigarette. It acts like a cigarette. It's being sold like a cigarette. It should be treated like a cigarette. And that's kind of that's how you distill that message. And since we talked last night, and I know your area of interest, you can say something like, people are dying of infectious diseases every day. The current medications that we have don't save them all. Think about if we could harness the immune system, the person's own immune system, to fight more effectively those infections. I'm studying the ways to harness the immune system and make it smarter to, and manipulate it so it can respond to those infections better. And what that means for the future is that we might be able to save more lives. Isn't it nice to have a professional write it for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, think, I think practicing that, I, I have various little sh speeches depending on who I'm talking to and what parts of the work that I do I'm talking to. So, you know, it can, it can come up in almost any context, and, and I think it's important just to have a clear explanation of, of what you're interested in and why you, you do what you do. Um, I mean, you, you all are picking a long path here, and there's a reason why you do that. So I think you just have to articulate that. Um, and leverage your unique strength. You all, as, as physician scientists, you have a unique strength, which um, means that if you start with a patient that motivates you and then you talk about bringing science to it, that's the unique thing about being an MD, PhD, right? Is that you can combine that. So look at, look at what makes you special and makes your voice special and use that, use that um, credibility that your training brings to communicate more effectively. That's a, that's a good question. Um, and it, it partially reflects, you know, sort of the general pop, public sort of lack of understanding of higher education, right? Um, so people variously think that I'm a psychologist. They don't, they don't understand psychiatry, psychology, you know, all these things. And they don't understand all these degrees. And they come in my office. And I, I, I debated actually putting up any degrees on the walls because it's really not intrinsic to what I do at this point in my career in terms of my identity. But I was actually told by higher ups in my department <laughs> that, that the patients needed to see my medical degree on the wall because otherwise it, they didn't feel like they trusted you. So when I tell, you know, I don't get too much into the fact that, that I have all these degrees. I, I tell them more about the fact of what I do, that I, I am a clinician, I take care of patients half the time, I'm a researcher, I spend a great deal of time working on this. My research is community-based research, and, and I spend a lot of time teaching and mentoring and training students. 
and, and when I sort of present it in those forms, generally people can understand. I mean, I had a cab driver the other day ask me, he's like, so, so he's like, you know, are you one of these teachers like that? And I said, yes, I am. And then he was actually surprised to learn that I actually took care of patients. And I said, no, no, I actually take care of quite a few patients. And, and then he wanted to know about those patients, right? And yeah, I mean, and this was a cab guy driving me around in Kansas from, you know, one of these talks that I was giving. And he was genuinely, I think, interested in that. So, you know, I, I make it more about my roles than about the degrees. But certainly advocating for MD, PhD programs, which um, funding for MD, PhD programs around the country is being threatened right now. And so I think, you know, you guys are, are the role models and, and frankly, the products of, of, of those programs. And so I think it is important to explain to, to people when in, in that context, um, you know, the fact that I have training both as a clinician and as a scientist positions me to, to take care of patients, understand the questions that remain unanswered, and then have the skills to go try and address some of those questions in the laboratory and bring those back to benefit the patient and the community and, and people around the world. And that um, while it's long training and while it's expensive training, you've decided that it's worth it because it allows you to come up with better solutions to improve health. I, I have to add, I, I think, you know, I'm not an MD, PhD, and I, um, I have to tell you that But every some of your time, best friends are. Exactly. <laughs> and, and the, the challenge, though, when I, um, you know, and even I run one of the largest public health departments in the country, and when I'm trying to advocate for MD, PhDs to be part of the health department, I always get a pushback from my, even from my own leadership team, because there's this perception that MD, PhDs are really great scientists, but are they good people's person? Are they good in managing public health? issues, are they good on more upstream things? So that's why, why the, the two minute you know, elevator speech is so important and communication skills and, and those are extremely, extremely important because in, in a government setting or in a setting that's very much community based, it's not, it's not easy to uh, really, you have to sell the added value and you guys bring a huge added value um, to whatever you go because you bring both that scientific curiosity and the questioning in addition to being a physician. And, you know, just listening to my two colleagues talk, there I think there are a couple of lessons in how they do it for all of us. And one is if you share something personal about yourself, that will make people trust you a little bit more. And so that's a very effective thing to put in. And then the other thing is, you know, a little bit of humor can be a good yeah. thing too. Right? And that can make you feel you know, more accessible to people, more authentic. And, and how you come across when you're delivering these messages. I mean, like when I listen to Dr. Karnick, I'm like ready to tell him my life story, right? Because he comes across as an com incredibly compassionate person. Well, remember, he's a psychologist. I know. I know. <laughs> That's why I need to tell him my life story. <laughs> Um, but, but, but the point is that, you know, people will, will listen differently depending upon how much risk you're willing to take, too. And, and, and that's important in communicating as well. So my Jedi mind trick worked, huh? It did. <laughs> I felt more. In the field of cancer research, often funding can be quite divisive. For example, breast cancer is very well supported by Susan D. Komen, whereas other types of cancer, such as lung cancer, um, recently highlighted by the work of Valerie Harper, which left an initial spread for non-smoking associated lung cancer, was very poorly funded, and she was very upset by this, and been interviewing all over the place, trying to publicize non-smoking associated lung cancer. So I wonder, public buy-in is very important for funding in general, especially for types of diseases that can be stigmatized, like HIV funding has been in the past, but now it's more productive. So I'm wondering what your opinions are regarding trying to obtain public buy-in for diseases that may be a little bit more difficult to sell to people that need uh, funding. 
So, you know, there's a lot of controversy about the, the most effective way to do advocacy, right? So, um, patient advocates are incredibly, they have very powerful stories, right? And, and that's why um, the Komen Foundation is so effective, um, because people have experienced it and understand the importance of, of, of that. Um, and, and, and then, in contrast to that, is, you know, oftentimes in science, and we've heard this throughout this conference. You're doing research in one area, and it ends up being a benefit in a completely different area, right? And so there are some risks to dis disease-specific funding. Um, and at least at the Lasker Foundation, we've decided to advocate to increase medical research in total. I think that um, one example of this has been there's, there's been some tension between basic scientists and clinical researchers over how the NIH dollar is split between basic research and, and clinical research. I, I think that these conversations about my disease or my kind of research really are unproductive. I think that we shouldn't be having conversations about how you divide up the research funding pie, but rather how you grow the pie as a whole to be larger. Um, and, and that's on the basis of I think that'll be the most effective thing. But also, science doesn't happen in silos. And you can't predict where the breakthroughs are going to be. And so really what we need to do, I think, the ideal thing would be if we could all combine our voices in a coordinated um, uh, way. Um, but to get to your specific sort of very practical question, I think there are diseases that are um, underfunded, and and research for them has has um, you know lagged, and I think that you have to tell the stories. Um, I served on the California Stem Cell Commission, and when one person would come in and tell their story, even if it was about a very rare disease that only affected a few people, that was the most effective way to get to attract research funding to that field. I, I think in my mind it's all about building constituencies. And again, that's probably because I've been in, in government for the last five years. It's really who's got the loudest voice and who's got the most effective voice, not just the loudest, the most effective. So you have to be able to build constituency. You have to be able to bring in the right people into these constituencies. And you have to be able to mobilize these con constituents to knock on the right doors. And if you do that, you'll be very, very, very effective. You know, I just look at, you know, my own departmental budget and the department here in Chicago, and you've seen, you know, funding for almost everything went down except two areas where funding went up every year, year after year. It's HIV, and it's anything related to services and schools. And for two reasons. On the HIV side, the HIV community in Chicago and the LGBT community is very, very powerful. They're very coordinated. They're very articulate. They know the right people. They got the ears of the right people. They're very, very effective, not even once. I cut funding for HIV or, or for HIV services over the last five years that I've been at the department where almost every other thing was cut. The other area that we've seen increases in funding is our investment in schools. And the reason why this is happening, because one of the main priorities of the mayor is improving the education system in the city of Chicago. So my goal as a department is how do I leverage or how do I position my department to be right in line with the top priority for the mayor? It's education, so we've developed a lot of interventions in schools. We've partnered with a lot of adolescent health folks. We've partnered with a lot of people interested in vision programs in schools, dental programs in schools, and you've seen year after year after year our investment in healthcare interventions in school more than tripled in the last five years that I've been at the department. So it's really all about positioning and having the right constituents doing the right, the right advocacy. And I think this comment about building constituencies is really important. Um, so, you know, if you go in and advocate for yourself um, as an individual, that's not nearly as effective yep. as if you pull together a group of, of diverse constituencies and can agree on a common message. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes a lot of pre-work, um, and it takes a lot of work to define where the commonality is. Um, but I think there are commonalities, and, and your voice will be much more effective yeah. in, if you work that way. Is there another question over there? Uh, 
I'd say first of all the biggest threat from my perspective is that you all actually go to residency get so enamored of clinical work that you actually do end up doing that full time because and I and I have you know I have so many friends for whom this is the case okay and they they're, they're lovely people they're they're smart people <laughs> they're, they're they are capable <laughs> clinicians okay but but to me it, it it's it's a it's a true failing of our training of physician scientists when that happens we haven't done something correct in that scenario because what what has ended up happening is you you you've picked up the role of a physician and 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 to, to your benefit, which you need to have that. I don't want any of you to actually be poor physicians. I want you to be <laughs> excellent physicians, right? But I, we have to figure out now that the challenge for physician scientist training is how do we sustain you during the development of your most core clinical identity and yet sustain your scholarly side in a way that's productive, okay? because we can't afford to lose any of you in this audience, all right? There are just too few of us out there, right? And I will say, I have been challenged, I have been vexed myself in my own career, drawn into, you know, at, at one point Kaiser was offering me this lovely job in California, you know, and it was just so, so enticing. You know, it, you know, I had this wonderful nurse and this great team and I would have been seeing, you know, amazing patients and I, I enjoy clinical work. I really, I, I you know, day in and day out. You know, I work with teenagers and young adults and I love to work with them. I, I could fill my whole day with that, right? But I managed not to do that and I think for, in my case, the credit goes to the fact that I chose a residency program where I had a mentor who's a clinician researcher who, who saw the value of the two fields that I had chosen to pair together, namely child psychiatry and sociology, and really stuck with me. And you know, he actually handed me a, a, a book chapter to write in my intern year. And I remember I would actually be post-call and I'd go and sit at Stanford's library and, and work for a couple hours on this book chapter, you know, like just writing away. And then I would go home and go to sleep. And it was this weird sort of schedule, but it was, it was something. And, and actually, the book chapter is certainly not my best piece of writing, given <laughs> when it was written. But it, it actually managed to get me through that intern year in, in a way that was really good. And then in, that, in the second year of my residency, I really ramped up my scholarly productivity. And you know, by the time I finished my residency and fellowship at Stanford, I, I had just a crazy number of publications because I was just digging through data that this guy had gathered over over 10 years of work and it was just sitting around in boxes and hadn't been published and he was he was really frustrated because all these students had left and hadn't finished projects and you know incomplete data sets and I just sat there putting all the pieces together and, and really and he also became my clinical mentor too I mean he he's he's one of the best adolescent psychiatrists in the country and and sort of you know mentored me on that side of my training as well and we have to figure out how to, you know, sort of match all of you up with those mentors for you, because they're out there. And, and I think you guys don't get enough advice, and I don't think our programs are mature enough to actually help you make that transition, um, because that's where we lose people. You know, I'm, I'm actually going to take it one step further, and I think, you know, nothing in my mind kills innovation more than insularity. So if you're only going to be interacting with other physician scientists, if your mentors are only going to be physician scientists, that's an insular path that will not be helpful 
for, for developing you as individuals, as professionals, to be bridge makers. And you have to be able to challenge, to, you have to be able to challenge your comfort zone. You know, and, and, I, and, and honestly, you know, when I came to public health, you know, everybody expected me to be interacting with a lot of doctors and nurses associations and hospital systems, and I do. I spend a lot of my time doing that. But I, I challenge that insularity every day, and I try to figure out who else I should be talking to that might not be your traditional partner in your field of research, in your area of interest, so that you can try to expand your horizons. You know, I, I tell people, I go spend every other Tuesday night with a group of uh, people in pink hair, earrings, and all of that doing, uh, they're, they're app developers or, or, or hackers or, or people who develop software. Because these are groups of people, and they, they have an interest in civic development. They have an interest in how to improve the society. So I go and sit down with them and say, these are some of the challenges that we're seeing in our community or in public health. Can you help me find solutions? And we are coming up with all kind of innovative ideas, ways that we might not have thought about. You know, one example is the way we track food poisoning in the city. You know, 50% of cases of food poisoning don't get, never get reported to the CDC or to the health department or anywhere. But I know from myself that sometimes people, although they might not call 311, but if they get sick from eating out at a restaurant, they go out and tweet it out and say, you know, I'm throwing up, I ate throwing out, I ate at, you know, McDonald's on Madison and Clark. Well, guess what? Now we've worked, I've worked with this group, the Code for America people, and now we have an app that sifts through tens of, tens of thousands of tweets every day that are coming from Chicago, and through machine learning is identifying the tweets that are coming out that could be related to somebody getting sick from eating at a restaurant. Then when we identify that tweet, we're communicating with that person and say, we're sorry you're feeling sick. If you answer these few questions, the health department will conduct the complete investigations. 90% of the people we interact with are following up with us, they're answering the questions. Then we send our inspectors to a full inspection of that restaurant. Then we post the results of the inspection or investigations online. And then we go back to the person who sent out the tweet and say, hey, thank you for notifying us about this. Here's a link to get the results of, the, of that investigation. So that type of innovation could not have happened if I didn't go and sit down with these Code for America people who Honestly, I wouldn't be necessarily hanging out with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think you have to be able to challenge the insularity and challenge your comfort zone and the people you engage. And just to pick up on that, I mean, I think both of you have said, you know, the excitement, the innovation is when it happens at interfaces yep. of fields. Yep. And that's exactly why you became MD, PhD students, I think, right? Because you were excited about that interface. And so the first answer to your question is to celebrate that unique niche that you have and, and don't feel like you need to go off in one direction or another because I think you, you lose that excitement. On a very practical level, though, the fact is when you're working at, at interfaces, it's more work. You have to learn more things. You have to interact with more different kinds of people. You have to incorporate more perspectives. And so you are going to have to optimize things like time management. And, and you know, it, however it works for you, but it's to-do lists. It's, you know, breaking things down into doable chunks, um, you know, defining goals. It's organizing your personal life so that you're, you know, maintaining a personal life without cleaning the toilets too often, okay? I mean, these, these are the practical approaches because you've made a decision to do something that is harder precisely because it's more exciting and more important. So I just want to start to wrap up. We ha at 4 o'clock there's the AAP address, so I want to give a chance to people to go to that. Any, just a few minutes, like two minutes, any final comments from our panelists um, for our young trainee group here? I mean, I would just say I, you know, people ask me, you know, students considering MD, PhD programs ask me all the time, you know, if I, you know, whether I would do it again. And I tell them all the time, I and mean, my answer is very simple. I mean, I wouldn't trade it. There are challenges in what I do every day, but for me, doing the dual training has just been this great journey. I've enjoyed 
every moment of it. It's let me do things that I just couldn't imagine I would be doing at this point in my career. And so I would say you're in a great space. You're, you're, you're in unique space. And I think you've picked the, the, the most interesting, challenging place in medicine to be. And for me, the excitement comes because I'm working in a place that's so, um, so there's so little understood, you know, and it's so much fun to work in that space. If, if we had all the answers, I, I tell people, you know, they, that would be neurology. Um, it would, it's not psychiatry, <laughs> you know? And so I think, oh, you know, you go over there, you go, oh, yeah, it's fine, you go over there. You know, I, I think, but all of you are working in parallel fields in that respect because you've picked an area that, you know, there is an answer that needs to be explored, you know, and your, your PhD will get you there. And I would agree, you, you all have, um, a very special voice. And I would just encourage you to use that voice for, for the mission that you've signed up for. Um, and it can get distracting, the, 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 the practicalities, the frustrations of day-to-day of -day things. And so my bit of advice is keep your eyes on the prize, because it's an incredibly wonderful prize. To me, this was just amazing. I'm, I'm a family physician. Couldn't be any further away from physician scientists. You know, we're known as, in family medicine, we know very little things about a lot of different things. And, and um, you know, it, it's great to kind of learn from everybody today. Um, you know, I, I do want to encourage you to stay connected with your um, um, local government, local public health department, your, you know, different community-based organizations. Your voice is very, very powerful. Don't forget the the added value that you bring when it comes to advocacy. You know, when it comes to an MD, PhD titles after your name, your voice is very, very powerful. Um, and then I will uh, conclude by saying, please, you know, follow us on social media as a local health department. <laughs> We're at Chai Public Health, and I'm also on Twitter, at Shukare, my last name. So um, uh, if you have any more questions or anything you'd want to follow up on, please email me or tweet me or just find a way to chat with me. I'll be more than happy uh, to communicate with you. But at Chai Public Health, make sure let's pick up a couple more followers before that. <laughs> so on behalf of APSA, we want to thank you for serving as panelists for us and giving us this great opportunity. We have a little token of appreciation oh, from nice. AFSA for each of you. More than the cookies? No, <laughs> no it's only the beginning. <laughs> now you get your very own APSA nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yes. So when you go to your conferences, you will remember us. <laughs> thank you so much. And then you can advertise for us as well. I'm not promoting us right. on any matter. And Thank then you know, help us with some funding. As you see, we have these wonderful <laughs> physician trainees, trainees who, as you stated yourself, need continued funding. <laughs> Thank you very much. Self-promotion <laughs> Self is good. That's one of the goals. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.